Hi, I'm Mike Conlon, your host of the Wiser Books Radio Hour. Today's guest is Nancy Hendrickson, author of Ancestral Tarot. Welcome to the show, Nancy. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Oh, it's great to have you on. Now, uh, we like you because uh, we just published your new book, Ancestral Tarot. Are there other books that you've published previously? You know, most I've published a lot of books in the field of genealogy or, ah. or history or and uh, coffee table books. And those are California and San Diego uh, history, which is where I live. So yeah, I've, I've published several. This is the first one that gave me the chance to mash my two passions, though, of family history and tarot. Now, which came first in your life, the interest in family <laughs> history or the tarot? Uh, I've been into family history since I was about eight. Ah. And it is because I had two grandmothers who were incredible storytellers. And so I have one of them talking about her grandfather being born in the garden during a civil war raid when the house was burned down and another grandmother talking about covered wagons and her grandparents. So family history was always around me. And, and everybody in the family was a family history storyteller. Oh, great. So that was natural. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you got a lot of oral history going on there. Oh, totally. Fantastic. Um, so when did, uh, when did you start with uh, an interest in the tarot cards? You know what? I, I was interested in my late teens, but I started taking classes when I was about 20. And uh, here in San Diego at the time, a woman named Jessica Macbeth was doing courses. And Jessica um, wrote the book for the Fairies Oracle, uh, printed several years ago. But she's always been into healing and using tarot. So I probably worked with her for two years. She kind of became a spiritual mentor. And she helped us get this incredible foundation in tarot. And I know people freak out about, oh my God, it's 78 cards. How do I remember all this stuff? But she gave us that super foundation. But then she wanted us also to be intuitive. So sometimes she would be tricky and say, we're not going to read tarot tonight. We're going to read chocolate chip cookies. Ah. And she'd bring out the plate of cookies and we would read them. Oh, fantastic. What a great yeah. way to do it. Uh, so uh, you got tarot, you got the, uh, the, the familial interest in uh, yeah. familial history. Um, how did those two come together in your life? You know, I, I've always been able to talk to the ancestors, which means I can ask questions and I can hear the answers. But I realized that tarot was a really easy portal into the ancestral realm. And once I started working with that, testing spreads, forcing all my friends to test all my theories, I realized they went together super well. And you can use tarot really to open that door, find out who you're talking about, who you're talking to, what messages they have for you. Uh, so it was, a, it was actually a really easy fit. Got it. Um... So in your bio, I noticed that, uh, you know, you mentioned that you're native to uh, uh, San Diego. Have you always been a Californian or? Have no, you been... my family moved here when I was 10 from uh, St. Joseph, Missouri, home of the Pony Express. Wow. Okay. So, well, you know, because I've done family history, I know that most of my family lines have been in America since the late 1600s. So I'm really, I'm lucky in that I kind of have that little piece of knowledge. But uh, growing up in until I was 10 in a place that was that really, you know, Pony Express, Pony Express, you're surrounded by this Pony Express history. You know, you cannot escape history living there. But we moved here when I was 10. So I kind of consider myself a San Diego native. Got it. Uh, where I was going with this is uh, in your bio, I noticed that uh, you're also very interested in uh, petroglyphs of the Southwest uh, oh, kind God. of. The, the native imagery and uh, the the obvious question that popped up in my head is, uh, you know, when you're looking at the tarot, you're looking at a lot of very archetypal images. Sure. Um, do you see crossover between uh, petroglyphs and tarot imagery uh, that you don't have to force, you know, kind oh, of like, ab oh. Absolutely. You know, I, I am, I'm kind of a petroglyph collector 
in that I travel the Southwest a lot and I go to places with petroglyphs. And if you stand on a cliff, on a trail by a cliff, blade, cliff face and just put your hand up on that rock face and realize that, you know, hundreds of years ago, pre-Columbus, somebody was standing there chipping off that symbol of the deer or the sun or uh, a wavy line for water. Uh, it, it was a total symbolic representation of their life, just as tarot is. It's a great crossover and a great question too, Mike. Oh, well, I, was just, I mean, it's, uh, you're also a photographer. You mentioned the coffee table books that you did. Yeah. Uh, so have you done a coffee table book, a, 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 a color picture book of the petroglyphs yet? No, it's, I have so many projects in the back. <laughs> you know, um, I love, it. we used to call it Anasazi. Now they prefer ancestral Puebloan. And I love going to those places because they have a feel of the sacred. And my sister who travels with me a lot, you know, we talk about how often we can hear voices kind of drifting down the canyons. And it's like, who is here? And those places are not empty. So they always draw me back and I would love to do that kind of book. Just essays of, of what it feels like to be where the ancients lived so thank you for giving me one more idea oh no worries because you don't have enough right <laughs> right uh so uh getting back to the book um the the book is ancestral tarot and it's uh it's interesting on my end of things because uh, when we initially decided to publish it, uh, I'm the guy that starts talking about uh, how many pages we can do, uh, mm -hmm. how many, you know, if it's got X amount of images, that's going to translate to Y amount of pages, uh, that kind of thing. And one of the things that very much surprised me about this is it's not a uh, tarot cookbook. There's no, uh, there's not uh, a list of the cards with an accompanying paragraph and a picture and kind of all that thing. So uh, yeah. if you would, uh, uh, please describe the kind of the structure of your book, uh, it, since it's not that cookie cutter. It, it is not book. that kind of book. Uh, I talk about why you even want to work with the ancestors. I mean, that's kind of a first question. But then I also structure the book into here are the three main bodies of ancestors that I see, although there are more of it, you know, I don't think uh, Wiser would like have, have done a 500 page book. So uh, I talk about the ancestors of blood who are the people whose DNA runs through you. I talk about the ancestors of place and that are the, those are the places that are kind of your genetic origins. So I don't know genetically where your family comes from. Do you know? Uh, um, yeah, three quarter from Ireland, one quarter from the Alsace Saint Germain region of France. Okay. So uh, you could tap into ancestors of Irish places. It would be a very a easy tap for you. And then I actually talk about ancestors of other lifetimes because I am an absolute believer in reincarnation because I've been so many places that I know I've been before. And, and they're so familiar and they're very homelike. So I talk about those three big groups of types of ancestors. There are more. There are kind of what I call your spiritual ancestors that are people that might have inspired you, but you have no blood connection to. So this will work even if uh, you don't know your family tree, if you don't Absolutely. have your genealogy yeah. at your hands. Absolutely. You know, if you've ever done DNA, it does help, but... I do actually give a couple of uh, websites that if you can type in your surname, it does give you a broad definition of, of, of the general part of the world that surname came from. And you know, if you're lucky, it will tell you what that surname meant or how it originated. You know, like uh, back before, I mean, surnames are, are, are recent in our human history and they would have started with, uh, John Hill, because he lived by the hill. John River, John Snow, he had he was pale and had light hair. 
So, you know, you can find out those kinds of origins. So pretty interesting. Absolutely. Uh, I was, you know, when I was younger, I was always fascinated that uh, to learn in what a Cooper was, you know, somebody. Oh, like, the barrel guy. The barrel guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and things like that. So that's, that's interesting. Um, and, and, you know, people, though, they really did. The, pe- there's this myth that at Ellis Island, they change people's names. That's really a myth. But what is true is a lot of people from Eastern Europe shortened their name just because they were fairly hard to pronounce. So it was the people who made those name changes, which makes it a little hard to trace them because right. you're not sure. And in my family, they they would sometimes call themselves Hendrickson, sometimes Hendrix, and they'd drop the S-O-N. I don't know why, and but it makes it harder. It makes it harder to find them because you don't know if you're looking for a Scandinavian or somebody from England. So right. two very different names. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we were out in Seattle recently and visited the uh, the grave of Jimi Hendrix. Uh, oh, any, yeah. Any relation? No, no relation to Jimi. Sorry. All right. Uh, so let's see. Um, when you're talking about ancestors, uh, you know, in, in my mind, I hear the word ancestor, I think some, you know, seventh, eighth, thirteenth generation removed. Um, how 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 does uh, recent relatives, recent uh, family members, even who have passed on, figure into all this? You know, I, I think there are two paths, and one is the the recent family member who made your life a living hell, and you were happy to see them go, and the family member who you miss acutely. And you can, I talk a lot about kind of family patterns and how both the positive side and the dysfunctional side of families tend to come down through generations. So let's say that through your generation was somebody who was passive aggressive towards you or belittled you or whatever. Now that they're in spirit, you have a choice. Do you wanna work with them? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe 10 years from now you do. I don't know. But I I give an example in my book of one of my grandmothers that I did not get along that well with. And when I worked through the things on the book, through the the exercises, I really understood her better. And it was healing for me. It was not, oh, I, I, I forgive you, grandma. That didn't come into it. What came in was, I understand you so much better and why our relationship was difficult. It was incredibly healing for me. And on the other side of that path is somebody like my mom, who I was so close to. And it gave me a chance to draw cards and say, are you okay? Will I see you again? And that was healing for me as well. So it doesn't really matter how close or how not close they are there's either some kind of healing or some kind of understanding that comes down. So do you get to choose which ancestors you're working with or do they choose you? you? I I love, I love that question because I think, wow, I'd like to know that guy. Come on down guy. And I don't think it works that way. (laughs) You know, I think that when people pass in the spirit, they have their own path to walk and they either want to come work with me or they're off doing their own path. One of my grandmothers, the other grandmother, I always have this sense of her that she went to some super post-grad school somewhere in spirit. I've never had a sense of her at all. And yet uh, my mom, I feel around me all the time. Uh, I think we can request you know, I would really like to meet so-and-so. If if you want to be here with me, let me know. And I'll, I'll draw cards to see what I can find out. Uh, and, and sometimes the answer is no. So no, you don't always get who you want. So what do you do? I mean, you're familiar with your genealogy. Can you use the cards to ascertain who you're talking with. Yeah, you know, I you can. 
And this is what I do. And this, this is the cards and a pendulum. And I, I love working with ancestors with this specific intent. And in this past week, I said, I want to talk to an ancestor who can help me answer a health issue. So I got out the pendulum. I, well, first I flipped a card. I got the Knight of Swords. I thought, okay, somebody who's really mental, who's, who always keeps learning. So I, I knew that. I got the pendulum and I said, did this person live in the 21st century? No. Did this person live in the 20th century? Yes. So I would have gone backwards through centuries until I got fairly close to where they were. I may never know their name, but I will know something about them. And I've said this um, when I was doing a presentation last week, I actually will pull up a map on, on my iPad and use the pendulum to try and hone in to a specific locality because I, I, I'm practical. I, I, I want the practical info. And those are the techniques I use. Got it. So it's not, uh, it's not quite just one technique. It's oh many, a many, whatever you got at your disposal. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it, I have a, a friend also very connected to Ireland and he's really a rune expert. So for him, once he starts getting into Norse ancestors, wouldn't it make more sense for him to pull out the runes to start figuring this out than tarot? So I think you use whatever tool you feel works for your particular situation. It's, it isn't cookie cutter work. Right. Um, so you, in your book, you talk about ancestral patterns. Um, can you just uh, uh, kind of delve into that just a little bit? Sure. You know, there are many. I'll, I'll say that. And I hate, I'm not picking on Ireland, but it's a good, <laughs> it's a good example. Let's say, um, okay, I have a friend whose husband grew up in a family that always said, we can't afford anything. We can't afford this. We can't afford that. Well, their daughter got accepted to UCLA, which is hard to get into, and it's not cheap. And his first reaction was, we can't afford that. And his background is Irish. That is, that is his genealogy. And I said, you know, look, Wayne, when your Irish ancestors came to America during the potato famine, they were penniless. Every, every penny counted. So unfortunately, that lack kind of came down through generations. It started in a very practical, reasonable way. But, you know, by the time it's gotten down here to the 21st century, it, it doesn't work that well anymore. Right. So that, that's, that lack is a pattern or that worldview, the world is a dangerous place. Fill in this blank. XYZ people can't be trusted. You can't travel. It's, it's not safe for a girl to travel. I, I, went to, um, I went to Alaska when I was 15 and I washed dishes on a boat. And I was telling this to a young friend of mine, and she said, my parents would never let me do that at age 15. And, but my family did not have the worldview that the world was a horrible place, and hers did. So those patterns do come down through generations. It's good to understand where they started. Right, right. And what an experience that must have been. Uh, it was a wonderful experience. <laughs> I, bet it was, I bet it was an education too. <laughs> it was an education and uh, it was, you know, give a 15 year old the freedom to uh, go to Alaska and wash dishes on a boat for the summer. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for sharing that. That's amazing. Um, so uh, in, in the book, you make a distinction or, or well, I, I actually don't know. Uh, I've got this canned question here. Is there a difference between spirit guides and ancestors? You know what? I, I, I have been asked that. If you think there is, there is. Okay. I think ancestors can be spirit guides. I don't think spirit guides are necessarily ancestors, though. Uh, you know, if, if, if an ancestor is with you every day, for all of your life, are they a spirit guide? I, I guess it comes down to how you define that. Uh, I just, I, I tend to, 
as things happen that are kind of magical and mysterious, I attribute them to ancestral help. And I think some people would call them angels or spirit guides. So that's just my take. Got it. Now, you talk about uh, ancestors of place, ancestors of time, as opposed to uh, kind of ancestors of blood. Mm -hmm. Um, When you're dealing with ancestors which are related to a place or a time, uh, could they be somebody else's ancestors that you're tapping into? Absolutely. I, I feel... Let me backtrack a second. I think when you do ancestral work, you start with an intent. It's like when I when I said my intent is to have an ancestor come help me with this issue. I think you start with an intent. And let's say that the ancestor that wants to come in was your 15 times great grandfather, best friend. I don't know who that person is. So yeah, I, and that's what I'm kind of calling your spiritual ancestor. Maybe somebody that you have no blood connection to. Maybe you didn't even spend a lifetime with them. I don't know. But if they have the skill or the knowledge that I'm asking for, I welcome them. And and I don't know that answers your question. And I can't prove that to be true or not true. And as I say, when I meet everyone on the other side, we'll we'll find out for sure. We'll figure it out at that point, right? (laughs) So let's see, I'm all of a sudden I drew a complete blank. Okay, so you- Okay, I do that all the time. I know, right? It's like there's so much stuff to unpack in this book here. The you've got a number of spreads. You start out with, I believe, the uh, uh, the the the, journey spread, the journey spread, and then uh, it seems like for every lesson, uh, for every chapter, for every lesson that you're coming across with, there's uh, there's a different spread. Some of them are familiar, like a three card spread. Um, The uh, the the journey spread uh, has seven cards. arranged uh, uh horizontally horizontally rather than vertically and right. um you've got this uh one mandala spread which looks like a, uh, a cross <laughs> spread on steroids it is. Um, so it is. i i guess uh you know and, and it's fine um you know for uh for people to r- run across these in the book but i'm wondering how how did you come up with these and uh yeah, well, how did how did you come up with these, and and how did they per, pertain to each kind of chapter or chapter. lesson that you're coming across with? You know, I did a lot of uh, number one. I pay attention to my intuition, and if it feels like five cards, then it's five cards, and I try and make the questions be salient to whatever I'm talking about. So that's that's kind of the the foundation of it, but. I do a lot of beta testing. You know, I don't just say, yeah, it's me, Nancy, saying, yeah, this is true, this works. I, I get it out to a lot of people and take feedback, and I change. I will change spreads depending on the feedback I get. But uh, the mandala spread that you mentioned, that was simply, a, I wanted to be able to compare all of my stuff with one of my grandfather's. I know ne- I didn't know either grandfather. So I wanted to find out how like him was I, how unlike him was I. And so by creating kind of a um, what is it in astrology, a sinistry chart between two people, I kind of cre- uh, created it to look like that because it, it was a simple way to compare two people in the same areas of their life. So how was grandpa in his work life versus, you know, his money life, his love life, his ego life. Um, It was, it was, that one was just because I love astrology. um, It it seemed to work, seemed to work really well. And it was a good thing for me to do because it, it gave me an intro to somebody I did not know. And it showed me how unlike we were And since I've done that spread and worked with him, he's the one who's constantly nagging, take a day off, take a day off, take a day off. Because I I had asked uh, my mom years ago, so what was he like? And she said, he was a joker. He was a flashy dresser. He loved not working. 
And so it, it made sense that that's what was coming through for me. And it, it, it this sounds kind of silly, but it's true. It has helped me temper my workaholicism and to try and actually blend more downtime. And because sitting in a chair and reading somehow feels wrong to me because I'm not working. So I'm getting much better at that. And I, I think that's because of the working with that grandfather. Great. Uh, and it did not answer your question about the spreads, but I think it kind of did. It, it, it does in a roundabout manner. I mean, yeah. uh, so, so essentially, you know, I mean, people can work through the spreads that you offer in this book, but probably once they're done with that, uh, they're branching out and doing their own spreads for whatever situation. Oh, I hope on. so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Yeah, I absolutely good. hope so. And now, of I, course, do, go ahead. I do talk, I do talk very briefly about creating your own spreads and how they look, and they don't always have to be linear. They can be helter skelter. If that issue for you is very jarring and helter skelter toss those cards in the air, see where they land. Uh, you know, I, I have no problem doing that. And I hope people will go ahead and create their own spreads. Great. Um, now in the book, we very unimaginatively illustrated with the Rider Waite Smith deck, yeah, we did. Um, uh, which is kind of our go-to. Uh, it's something that we can toss into a book without... Right dealing with rights issues and whatnot. Uh, right. So it's it's kind of an out on our end. But in the beginning of the book, you talk about uh, quite a few other decks. I know that uh, on your website, you've got a blog post about that. And uh, right. for people who aren't seeing the, the, the video image on the screen right now, uh, we chatted about the deck that you've got set up in your background, which is uh, a deck called the, uh, the Relative Tarot by uh, Carrie Paris. Mm -hmm. um, Talk to me about uh, the different decks that you would suggest people use for uh, ancestral work. You know, I think it depends on your age and your culture and your comfort level. So if you live in the UK, you're, you're very fortunate in that you have so many UK Celtic based decks that because that's the culture you grew up in, it's probably really familiar to you. Like I love uh, the Druid craft and the Wildwood, but there are image images I don't relate to because I don't know their I don't know their history as well as I know our history. So uh, culturally, the Hoodoo Tarot is an African American tarot that I've just started working with. If I were African American, I would probably be very drawn to that deck because it, it really does reflect daily life, not just today, but kind of through the continuum of time of African Americans in America. If I were uh, 30 years old, in fact, it's the deck I've been working with, uh, again, because of the green screen, you may not see it right, but uh, yeah, you can't. Um, uh, the Modern Witch Tarot, because it is incredibly inclusive of both race and culture. It, it's imagery, uh, the, I'll give you a quick example. The fool, as we all know, is, is a guy with his dog getting ready to walk off the cliff. Well, in the modern witch tarot, she has her, iP her iPhone, iP you know, ear pads, ear pods in, and she's listening to music. And it, it just is so reflective and instead of a, uh, in the Eight of Pentacles, instead of a workman at a bench, it's an artist with her iPad drawing on her iPad, which I love because it, it does reflect today. And, you know, I'm sure, I don't, I don't know based on the work you do with Wiser, I don't know, I'm sure you've heard of all the, the diversity issues in tarot decks. And, you know, it, it is kind of a big issue and I get it, you know, I don't want a deck that's just a bunch of, of white people. It sounds terrible, but I don't want I don't want that deck. I don't want just a specific culture because I don't relate to it. I live here on the border with Mexico. I could not get through a day of my life without working, seeing, talking to Hispanics or Asians. 
it, that's just part of my life. And I want to see them in a tarot deck. Yeah, we just did uh, Shaheen Miro's Uncommon Tarot and it's uh, the, the have, images are, yeah, 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 good. I have that deck, yeah. The images the images are pretty straight. You know, if 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 you hadn't already had one, I would have had to send you one. So, but thank you for purchasing it. I, you're very <laughs> welcome. You're very welcome. I have that. I do have that. It, it's, well, I like collage decks personally yeah. because they, they give you so much to look at. Yeah, absolutely. I, I know that uh, uh, prior to the show, we were talking kind of the uh, the nuts and bolts of package production for tarot mm -hmm. cards. And you showed me another one we did, uh, uh, Arthur Tossig's The Al Alchemical Visions Tarot, right. um, which is another one that uh, uh, I'm not sure it's as diverse as Shaheen Miro's, but uh, certainly it's uh, it's not uh, it's not simply white guys. It's it's a very union approach to tarot. And if you are a longtime tarot reader, you actually are not going to recognize the imagery as as being quote tarot. But it really, if you do dream work or tarot journaling, uh, there's so much to dig into with every one of those cards. It's, it is amazing. So I'm wondering, uh, you know, I, I hate to get off on a tangent, but I love getting off on a tangent. That's great. Um, Me too. With uh, with the the alchemical visions tarot, I mean, when we were making that, the cards are very much oversized. Uh, they're yes. on thick stock. It's not particularly a deck you would want to uh, work with by hand and shuffle and kind of all the the usual things that you would do with a tarot deck. Uh, and we made it because we assumed uh, per uh, per the author's kind of understanding of it that people would pretty much dwell you know draw a card and dwell on that card um do you find yourself using it that way or do you find yourself using it kind of more as a regular tarot and doing spreads with it uh, i actually uh, it's it's really interesting you brought this up because i had this very conversation with two other tarot friends and i i took the deck with me one evening and and we were looking through it and, and we were saying how did he interpret the, the how did he how did he do that how did he interpret this card this way and we all decided it is not something to read as normal tarot it's it just does not lend itself but if you as i said if you do dream work or journaling pull one card out and you will be shocked through the course of the day how much you see in that card because it's packed with imagery well you know you worked on it it's absolutely packed yeah, yeah, yeah. That's another one um, where I've got a press sheet kicking around and it's it's actually overwhelming. You know, it's like all those images all at once. Um, it's hard to focus on just one. And uh, certainly when you're looking at them in totality, it's amazing what pops out when you're almost least expecting it. Uh, absolutely. And um, even if it were normal tarot, just because of the size. Right. It would be hard, it, let's say you were a reader somewhere, it would be hard to use that deck because you could only do probably three cards on your little reading table. Right, 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 right. You're going to run out of space. <laughs> you but, need a <laughs> table. <laughs> well, you know, but if you're, if you are into union type of psychology, it's, it's a deck for you. Oh yeah, for sure. For sure it is. Uh, what other decks do you use? We, we mentioned the relative tarot. Uh, I I do. I, I like the Modern Witch. Uh, I like the Radiant Rider Weight, but I use so many different ones. And it, this might be because of my love of, of Native American culture. I love the Vision Quest Tarot, which, which has been around for a long time. And because of my age, you know, I kind of grew up in the space age. I have a it's called Star Maidens Tarot. It was made in Germany. Totally pop culture imagery. I, I love that deck. Um, you know, it's tucked away. I'll never get rid of it. Uh, it's very hard to find. So I, I pop around. It just depends on what I feel like reading. It sounds like your guilty pleasure deck. It is a guilty pleasure deck and it's beautiful. <laughs> and part of it too, I think, is, is who I might be reading for. You know, there are some decks, um, I think relative tarot, because you've worked with it, you know what it looks like. It's a very, um, 
if somebody's emotionally vulnerable, it is not going to be an in your face, I'm going to make you uncomfortable deck. It's, 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 it's familial. So it's easy to work with. Also the inner child deck, it's all based on fairy tales. And so you're, you're going to see like Robin Hood and you're going to see the Tin Man from the Wizard of Oz. Those are wonderful decks. Uh, I gave one to a, one of my nieces or nephew when they were really little. They loved all the, all the colors, but it's a great deck for relationship readings because, and I know now I'm really on a tangent because relationship issues, I think, are very childhood based. And so why not use a fairy tale deck? It, it, it's just, it works for me. So uh, yeah, to answer your question, I am embarrassed to tell you I have several drawers full of decks and uh, I go from one to the other. Okay, great. I've got, to, I've got a wall of decks behind me. Uh, okay right over there I see. Um, okay. but it's uh it's more packaging reference than anything that i use on a regular basis i'm ashamed to say but you know what packaging makes a difference though sure does sure does <laughs> it, at least in my world uh uh it, it really does um, well in my world too if i don't like the picture on the package i probably won't buy the deck wow all right or the book right right to be for honest sure. with you for sure uh how'd we do on your cover you know, the very first go, I said, this looks kind of like a genealogy book because genealogy books will, uh, yeah, I know, <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, anyway, I have actually come to love it because I've had such good feedback. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and you know, I've had really good feedback from people who, the book came out officially March 1st, but it was being delivered the week before. So I have a lot of people who have already started working through it. And I've gotten such incredibly good feedback. And uh, one of my favorites, I just have to tell you this because I'm off on another tangent. A woman was at, drew a card. She thought she knew the ancestor. She wasn't sure. And she said, is this you? And the hand mirror on her bathroom wall fell off ah. at, at the same moment. That was like absolute quick confirmation. Yeah. So getting stories like that from people. And I absolutely love it. So uh, when, when you, you, you mentioned doing readings for others, uh, you know, the ancestral tarot book, as far as, as, as I got into it, seems to be more about doing this for yourself, uh, which I, I think agree. is how a lot of people do. Do you do ancestral readings for other people? I do when I have time and I'm not up against a deadline. Yeah. Right. right, But right, right. yes, and you know, in fact, on Instagram on Halloween, uh, which is right, butts right up against Day of the Dead and all other, All Souls Day, All Saints Day, you know, they all come together at the same time. On Halloween, a friend and I did an Instagram live and we went almost two hours just giving ancestral messages to people. I loved it. And it was just, I didn't think it was ever going to end because there were so many people. And my, I shuffled the cards so much the next day, my thumbs hurt. I couldn't, I guess like I couldn't move my thumbs, but I loved giving those ancestral messages because they were so meaningful to people. Good. And, and a lot of the questions were from people who had lost their parents or a child. And, you know, do they have anything to say to me? So it was really moving to be able to, to pass along those messages. That's got to be a fairly common request on your end, I imagine. It is. It is. And the ones of uh, people who've lost children, I think, are hard. Just uh, those are the tough ones, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh all right. Uh, what have I not asked you about your book that you want to get across to people? Well, I, maybe why, why do you care about working with ancestors? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Okay. Your question. Yep. Um, once you have a sense of all these literally millions of ancestors, and I, I tell people this that if you go back 500 years, you have more than 1 million direct ancestors. That's only 500 years. That's nothing. That's a blink of an eye. 
so once you have this sense of all these people who love and support you, because most of them do, I think it just gives you this massive sense of strength and power because you are descended from warriors and you are descended from survivors. And if that doesn't make you feel strong inside yourself, I'm not sure what would. So for me, that's part of it for me is I can't tell you how strong that makes me feel. And no matter what comes down the road, I know that I'll survive it and I'll be okay. And that's because I feel all those people behind me. So let me ask you this. It just suddenly occurred to me to, uh, to ask this. Uh, a lot of people are into past life, past life regressions. Yeah. Um, is there a substantive difference and doesn't even matter uh, if you are keying in with an ancestor versus perhaps a past life self? Or, a, or an ancestor in a past life. Right, right, right. Uh, no, I don't think so. And I, I don't know, have you, and I'll turn the tables on you. Uh, have you ever had a sense of a past life? Yes. And when you talk about ancestral patterns, uh, I've also experienced that. Uh, unfortunately, it usually involves uh, a farmer or peasant type at the uh, business end of a spear or sharp pointy weapon of war. But uh, that's the sense I got, um, you know, for what it's worth, you know, over a course of many lifetimes. <laughs> well, but, yeah, I get that. But you, going back to Ireland, <laughs> there are certain cultural expectations of somebody who's Irish. And I don't know if that comes down to you, but to the outside world, you know, it's, oh, Irish, they love to have wakes and drink and have a hell of a party on St. Patrick's Day. I mean, I'm generalizing and it's in their silly generalizations, but I think there are kind of cultural expectations that most people carry. And I don't know if that's true for you. Well, it is. I mean, uh, the, uh, uh, I tried my hardest with the drinking thing, but that didn't quite work out. So here I am today. Uh, but no, I mean, it's interesting because we went out to, uh, I've been over to Ireland a couple of times and it's just amazing how familiar it feels. And it's not just the places that I would have seen in, you know, a tourist book or right. uh, a coffee table book or a movie or anything like that. It's uh, a lot of the more pastoral places that, you know, quite frankly, would rate as quite boring um, to most people. Um, just the landscape, uh, the seasonality, the, uh, you know, even just the, uh, the weather and whatnot, all that just uh, uh, does does have a familiarity to it to me that, you know, I don't get in other places. And that's the feeling I get sitting in an ancestral Puebloan ruins in the Southwest, that it's, I could be there all day and be happy because it's so familiar. Right. And I love the landscape. I love the sky. I love everything about it. And it's just super familiar. So you know what? It, it's interesting. I have not tried to tap into those ancestors yet. And I think that would be a good thing for me to try. Absolutely. Have you tried tapping into your Irish ancestry? I haven't. Um, not, uh, not to any extent. I mean, on the genealogical side, I've got a pretty clear idea of uh, where my people came from and, uh, and traveled around, um, you know, mostly uh, central and southwestern Ireland is uh, where most of us uh, originated from. But, uh, you know, the, the fun part is on, uh, on my mother's side, and I've never been there, the, the Alsace-Saint Germain area of France is one of those areas that, uh, you know, anytime there's a war, you know, they, it's swept through there one way and then the other. So that's very true. Uh, you know, that's, uh, as tragic as war is, I'm sure that opened, uh, that really opened up my ancestry to, you know, any number of, uh, permutations from there, but uh, not, I haven't, I haven't really explored that yet. And, uh, honestly, it's, it, it's something that I should, uh, because like I said, uh, I've got a, I've got a, I've got a big sense of where, of what happened to a lot of my people. And it's, 
you know, the sense is that it's a miracle that I'm here to, to, to be talking with you because so many of them uh, died violent deaths. But um, uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, there, there's, there's almost a, uh, uh, a bit of foreboding about that too. Uh, really? yeah. Um, you know, once you know something, you can't unknow it. Um, and I'm not sure, uh, you know, I watched that, uh, what's the, um, the show on, uh, PBS, uh, Bruce Gates. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the one where they, they go back and, uh, you know, go back through your family tree and, right. You know, too too often, uh, especially when he's talking to white guests, you know, it's like, oh well, you know, there's slave owners in your past, and it's like, oh, that's a that's a tough one to come to grips with. Um, so it's not only that, uh, you know, my 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 ancestors uh, and I in past lives perhaps were murdered violently, but that they would have been on the murdering end of things. I mean, I suppose, uh, like you said, there's there's something to the fact that here we are talking to each other. You know, we are among the groups of people that survived in a uh, right. kind of tooth and nail kind of world. So, uh, yeah, there's a sense of foreboding there that, you know, um, being survivors, you know, there were a lot of not nice things that our ancestors did to get us to where we are right now and that's really true and i ha actually had this conversation yesterday my south carolina ancestors were slave owners i have a hard time with that and i am still on the fence of what to do about it and i don't know whether to directly try and contact in with them or if it's just something within myself i need to work on and i'm on the fence i don't i don't have the answer yet but it is, it's inconceivable to think that owning a human was okay. Right. I, I, I cannot wrap my head around that. And, um, and then I know logically that African-Americans were not seen as humans. And I, I don't know, it, it, it's such a big mess in my brain, I've got to figure that. I've got to figure this one out. So, for the same reason that I don't want to go back. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, you know, that's got to be about the same thing on your end. You know, how do you confront that, and what do you do with that yeah. information? What do you do with it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've got we've got books on confronting the dark side. I know that uh, uh, that's a big part of uh, Jungian work. Um, but boy, that's a, it's intimidating to approach. That's for sure. It is, but you know what? I have great faith in pulling out this tarot deck and seeing if I can tap in and and maybe I'll find out nothing. Right. I don't know. Right. Maybe you will find out nothing. I don't Correct. know. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, Nancy, this has been uh, a fantastic uh, interview yeah. to uh, be doing with you. I've really enjoyed my time with you. And, oh, uh, me too. Thank you. you know, best of all, you've, uh, you've really got me thinking. <laughs> All right, uh, Nancy, if, if people want to find you uh, online in the internet and uh, in the ether, uh, because we're all still basically locked up due to COVID, um, yeah, we are. Where, where do they go to find you and uh, uh, what do they find online when they're looking for you? You know what, they can go to my website, which is sageandshadow.com. But where I am most active is Instagram. I'm on Instagram a lot. And my handle is Nancy Sage Shadow. And I post on there at least a few times every day. I do Instagram lives, uh, get on, talk about various tarot topics. Or one of my favorites is to interview people who have a very different cultural background than my own. So we can kind of compare how it was growing up um, in an Irish household in an Italian household, in a Jewish household. I, I find those are great conversations. So Nancy Sage Shadow on Instagram. All right, perfect. Thanks so, thanks so much for spending time with us, oh, Nancy. Thank you, it's been great. You've been listening to the Wiser Books Radio Hour. Find us online at www.wiserbooks.com.